Mother's Day seems to be that day in the year that we feel most comfortable just letting it all out about how we feel about our mothers. I remember when I was a little boy in grade school, Mother's Day was a, an opportunity for teachers to teach me how to show gratitude to my mom. They would lead our whole class in making beautiful crafts that were, were saved for decades by our mothers to say how much we love them. And they led us through that as an opportunity. Through my teen years and, and college years, I think it felt more like an obligation because in those years we tend to be more self-consumed, but we know that our mother's important, we love her, but we also are out spreading our wings and doing things out in the world. And I remember it was like a, an obligation. But as I got older, it became an ovation that was a thrill to share to my, with my mom. My mom's been gone now and he to heaven for s over 16 years, uh, but it is still uh, Mother's Day is an opportunity for me to praise what I realize God gave me in the blessings of a mother. I'm sure you feel the same way, and, it, and, and, and you're thinking about on Mother's Day, if your mother's gone, all the many ways you were blessed by her, if she's still here, you're thinking of ways that you can express it to her. The idea of having a mother, though, is a varied experience for everyone. But there is a mother that's common to all Christians. And in the scriptures, it's the mother called the church. Uh, in Revelation 12, in a very cha uh, chaotic vision, it says there was a woman and she was going to give birth to a child and she ran out to the desert. And that woman is not just the Virgin Mary, but it represents all believers on earth. And there she's called a woman or a mother. And, and there are a few other places where especially the church is called the bride of Christ. And today on Mother's Day, I want us to think about what blessings we have in this bride of Christ that we are a part of, but also it's been like a, an alma mater, a nursing mother for all of us. So I've chosen a scripture from Hebrews. It's Hebrews chapter 12. So make sure you have that open. You'll be able to see the verses on the screen as I'm talking about them. But it'd be, it'd be neat for you to see it in its context. So the writer to the Hebrews is writing to a group of Christians who have grown up as members of a Jewish family, but were, they were taught somewhere in their young adult or adult life that Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of all of their Jewish hopes and dreams. And they became Christians who were people from a Hebrew nation or he, Hebrew ethnic background. Their own families that did not believe in Christ worked hard to draw them back to their Judaism and away from Christ. And the writer to the Hebrews is adamant as he writes, when you have Jesus, you have the real God of the Old Testament, the real God of the Jews. And to go back to the Judaism that you grew up with is actually to become a religious pagan. You're getting away from the better, the better faith, which is the faith of the Messiah, the Christ. And he writes uh, hard and fast about all the ways that Jesus is better than the old covenant under Moses and the, the, the priesthood uh, around the temple in Jerusalem and how it didn't do enough and Jesus did it all. When you get to chapter 12, you are only one chapter from the end of the book and he is ready to make one last ditch effort to help them see that they really are at a place of decision to choose between the old mountain Mount Sinai, where the Ten Commandments were given, and the mountain in heaven called Mount Zion, which is actually there is a little hill called Mount Zion that Jerusalem is built on, but it becomes a symbol for heaven. I'm going to read to you this section, and what he's saying is you've come to the church. He even uses the word church. You've come to the church that's been called out of a worldly faith, and you don't ever want to go back to Mount Sinai. So I'm going to read to you now from Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to start at verse 18. And so read along with me and, 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 and watch how God develops this idea that he wants us to love our mother, the church, as much as we love him. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm 
That's what Mount Sinai was like. Remember when Moses went up on the mountain and there was thunder and lightning and darkness and storm and God said, don't touch the mountain. If you do, you'll be, you'll, you are to be put to death. You didn't come to this mountain that has a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them. After Moses came down from the mountain, every time God spoke it thundered, the people said, we don't want to talk to God. You talk to him for us. Because the, the people said this, that they didn't want the word spoken to them, verse 20, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. Basically, we would say today that freaked out the people of Israel, that God would say, even if an animal comes up on this mountain when I'm here, it'll be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. That is what the old covenant was like when it got started. Now he says, Christians have a new mountain and a new covenant. Listen to how he says it. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. I'm going to, in a few minutes, I'm going to unpack that paragraph about the church and, and what it means for us. God, the, the writer to the Hebrews goes on to encourage them to stay faithful to Christ. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks, meaning God. If the people did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth back in Moses' day, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? The Holy Spirit came down from heaven, filled the apostles, and taught us the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if he warns us if we turn away from Christ, we'll be lost. How much more than even on earth should we be afraid? At that time, at Sinai, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised, and this is from Haggai talking about the gospel. Once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate that the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Haggai was saying in the Old Testament times, when the Messiah comes, he will bring the end of the world eventually, and even the elements of this earth will be shaken. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom, he means Christians, that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for God is a consuming fire. This Scripture gives us the fear and love toward God that he wants and that we want to have as well. I'm a, I told you I would unpack that paragraph that's about talking about our mother, the church. So let's look at it together now and let's talk about it. It starts at verse 22. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Uh, it, to understand the emotions of what he is provoking in his readers, the Hebrews, you have to understand a little bit about the way a Jewish person feels about the city of Jerusalem. The, the word Jerusalem means city of peace. And for many centuries, Jerusalem for them has been the place where God dwells. That's where David moved, he moved the movable tent into the city where God dwelt in the tabernacle and then had Solomon, his son, build the temple right there in the middle of Jerusalem. At the dedication of the temple, God talked about how he would dwell in the temple and, and his presence, his holy presence and his loving presence would stay there. There was even the glory of the Lord with a cloud and a pillar of fire that appeared over that temple when Solomon dedicated it. And from then on, even when, when uh, the temple was destroyed, people like Daniel would pray toward the temple because it was that promised presence of the Lord. 
Uh, Jonah, when he was in the belly of the big fish and it's swimming all different directions, said in his heart, he prayed toward the temple. There are psalms even in the Bible and songs today that are about Jerusalem being the holy city. And all good Orthodox Jews have an aspiration to not only make pilgrimages to Jerusalem, even though the temple, the only thing that's left is the Western Wall, but they also have a, an aspiration is to live in Jerusalem near the temple so that they would be there when the temple is rebuilt, as they think according to their own prophecies that will happen. In fact, some Orthodox Jewish homes will, if they build a home, because Haggai was the prophet who said, why are you building your own homes, but you won't finish the temple, in order to kind of remind themselves of that prophecy, when they build a new home, they'll leave an unfinished section of a foot or two so you can see into the studded wall, because they don't want to finish their home before the temple is finished. The disciples, when Jesus was leaving on Tuesday of Holy Week and they were walking out of the temple, did the normal Jewish thing by praising the glories of the temple, which were like the glories of the Lord. And they said, look at the great stones that are here. And some of those stones are 36 feet long, four feet tall, six feet wide. And it was a monumental task but the day before modern machinery and hydraulics to move them there. And the disciples would marvel like any good Jew would. And Jesus said, not one stone will be left upon another but they relished and reveled in the temple. In fact, to the, 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 wit, the, wit, the witnesses that condemned Jesus, the big item, accusation they brought against Jesus was that he said he would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, which meant he was blaspheming God. That's the feeling that Jews have toward the temple and the city of Jerusalem and the temples built on a little hill called Mount Zion. And this writer says to the Hebrew Christians, by coming to the church, you have come to the heavenly Jerusalem, the Mount Zion, which is the city of God, which is in heaven. He's saying, this is the one that can't be shaken. It won't be destroyed. You have come and you are a part of the presence of God, the church. In heaven right now, there are angels, he says. He said there's a, an assembly of angels all around in heaven. And that assembly is praising God. And, and later in the Bible, in Revelation, John gets a vision of all the angels praising God for his plan of salvation and all the believers that are there. And this is where the writer of the Hebrews is saying what the vision in Revelation is saying. Christians today are, are part of a church of people that's on earth and in heaven. For those who have already gone before us as believers in Christ. In our communion liturgy, sometimes we will sing with all the saints, or the, the pastor will pray, with all the saints on earth and the, the saints in heaven, we join their glorious song. That's our church. We're in fellowship with the God of heaven, and we have a temple and a city and a place. Just one more illustration, and then we'll move on. Uh, if, if a if a family or a person is, are avid fans of some kind of college sports team, like the, the University of Texas Longhorns or the Texas Aggies or Baylor Bears, if they're, they're great fans of that college team, they will feel as a fan just out there in the community sort of disjointed and separated. But one of the things they love about being at big sporting events is all those fans come together and they're all wearing the same colors and they're glorifying the same team, and the, the stadium just roars if some little good thing happens. That is an emotional connection to what the writer to the Hebrews is saying, that we feel when we're on a pilgrimage as fans of Jesus, but in heaven there's this huge myriad, and we're going there. We are getting there. We are part of the winning team of the entire universe and, and, and that's ours. We're, we're, we're part of that. Well, that's our identity. That's what the church has given us. It's an identity that will not pass away like earthly identities, but an identity of being part of the winning team in heaven forever. The angels are around the throne of God singing. But he has more to say about this church that you're a part of. He says, it's the church of the firstborn. This is where an English word can let you down just a little bit. You can use firstborn as 
a singular for an individual, or you can use firstborn as a plural where it's kind of a, 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 a noun that acts as an adjective, and that's the way it is here. This is a plural, but there's, there's, we don't add an S and say it's the firstborns. That's not good English. But actually, that's what he's saying. You've come to the church, the called out ones from the world that are the firstborns. You are, the, you are part of the firstborns. Well, what again, to Jews, what is that? Firstborn was the oldest in the family who got a double amount of inheritance compared to the rest of the sons in the family because he was going to be the patriarch to carry on the family's business and the family's uh, identity in the community. And so he got a double portion. So what, here's, here's what the writer is saying. As believers, we get the blessings of life on earth like all unbelievers do. We get to live in houses, drive cars, have jobs, have countries to live in like America that's so wonderful. Or if you're really fortunate, you get to live in Texas. And we get all of that on the earth. And that's one portion. Unbelievers get that. But as believers, we get another portion, which is heaven, which is better by far than Texas or America or any other inheritance that we have on the earth. We get a double portion because we are the children of God. We are the firstborn. You have come to the firstborns. You are one of the firstborns. You get a, the life on earth and life in heaven all by grace through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what your mother, the church, has given you when she gave birth to you through the gospel. That's what he's saying. Don't go back he says to the, the world who doesn't have people called out from the world, like that's what the word church means, you're called out. Come, stay in the church that's given you a double portion, a double inheritance. He goes on. He says, whose names are written in heaven. The idea of Jews keeping genealogies so that they could secure their inheritances on the earth and make sure everybody's property was kept in the family. They would keep genealogies and to secure their bloodline all the way back to Abraham. He says, you've come. They would write down these genealogies and they would look for their names and their family names in the books. He says, well, your names are written in heaven because you have a place there. You are going to be there. Your names are written in the book of life in heaven. We, our, our inheritance is secure beyond this life. You have come to God, the judge of all. This is important, but you got to slow down and figure it out. The, the, everyone has a natural knowledge that there is a God and that we are accountable to him. And it strikes fear in the heart of all people. Some don't want to admit it, but it is one of the reasons people stay away from churches is because they know they talk about God there and they know their own sins. And so when they th know about people talking about God, the judge of all people, they're just worried about being judged by people and by God. And they just want to stay away from all of that because they are phobic about God. But we've come to God, the judge of all, and we're not afraid of him. We get to come before the judge, and we have faced the fact that we are sinners. We have already experienced our judgment that we are, by nature, condemnable people. We should be condemned, but we're not. And that's what the next phrase is about. We get to be around the God of judge of all people without feeling judged. Because it says, we are the spirits of the, the in heaven, they're the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And we are with Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. And to the sprinkled blood that speaks of better blood than the blood of Abel. I'm going to talk about Jesus as the mediator and we'll go back to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. So the judge of all, meaning God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, sent Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, to the earth. And he's our brother. And as the human family, we killed our brother. Just like Cain killed Abel. And in chapter 11, right before chapter 12, it says Abel's blood cried out for vengeance to God because 
He had lived by faith and Cain killed him because he didn't like that Abel was getting attention from God as he lived by faith. So Cain killed his brother and, his, and Abel's blood cried out for vengeance. But here the writer is alluding back to that that he wrote in chapter 11. And he says, our brother Jesus, whom we killed, shed his blood too. But his blood actually is the mediation of a better covenant than the covenant with Moses. It's the covenant of grace and mercy and forgiveness. So Abel's blood cries out for vengeance, but Jesus' blood cries out for propitiation, for expiation. It's, it's the blood of Christ crying out for forgiveness, grace, and mercy for us. And it's what we find as our peace. And we, the human family, killed our brother, Jesus. So the judge of all has actually paid the price with the blood of his own son. And we have this message called the good news. No other religion has a good news like this. All other religions are about working your way to heaven through mystical prayer, working hard through morality, or intellectually trying to find God in some kind of philosophy. But only one has a God who came down and sacrificed himself at the hands of humans to pay for the ones who killed him and all other people for their sins. That's the church. That's the inheritance of grace that we have. Now, I'll go back to that phrase of what we get in the church. There, and it's talking about people in heaven, people, not just angels. The spirits of the righteous made perfect. There, this, this is a beautiful little phrase that packs in the whole Christian life. We are declared righteous because Christ died on the cross for us and said it is finished. But we are made complete through our life of faith as the Holy Spirit works with us and teaches us to drop off more and more of our sinful attitudes and our sinful emptiness and cling more and more to the fullness of what we have in Christ. So that's called growing in faith or growing in holiness or being perfected. Well, once you get to heaven, when you pass from this life to the next, the big bonus is the, the monkey of your sinful nature is sloughed off as you pass into heaven and your spirit is there and it's holy. You were made righteous by the blood of Christ and when you came to faith, it was applied to you. You lived out your earthly life, walking with God and the Holy Spirit but when you, and, and you're being matured and perfected but when you step into heaven at the end of your earthly life, boom, you are made complete or perfect. It's a beautiful thought, and it only comes through the church. You say, what do you mean? Well, the church is what gave us the Bible. The, the church received it from heaven. Jesus came for the church, but he said, I'll send my Holy Spirit at Pentecost. He'll guide you into all truth. He'll give you the teachings, and he'll call people and gather them and enlighten them in the whole Christian church on earth. And so it, were, it was members of the church who wrote the Bible. It was members of the church who preserved the Bible. It's members of the church who have faithfully taught it and spread it all over the planet. It's members of the church in your family that made sure you got the gospel of grace and peace through baptism, Lord's Supper, and the Word of God. It's the church. It's your alma mater, your nursing mother. And it's the church that keeps calling you back. And it's the church that's preaching to you online right now. It's the church of God, the bride of Christ, whom we are a part of and whom also is our mother. And that's a spiritual Mother's Day for all of us Christians. That levels us all into the same family, and we all have the same beautiful mother. Um, the writer to the Hebrews is very emotional and, and, and uh, very uh, spiritual about what happens if a person rejects God's word and God's church. He says... Um, verse 25, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they didn't escape who refused him in the Old Testament, what will happen if he warns us from heaven, which he's talking about the Holy Spirit warning us through the church from heaven, came down from heaven, filled the church, and he warns us. And then he says, we are receiving a kingdom that can't be shaken. I'll read verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Uh, 
I said to you that when I was a little boy, Mother's Day was an opportunity for teachers to show me how to show gratitude. Then I said it was an obligation during high school and college. But as I grew, it became an ovation that was a thrill to share with my mother, to show her how much I appreciated it. What if I said that it was an opportunity and an obligation, but it never graduated from obligation, and that I still struggle to even feel gratitude toward my mother? Some of you know who my mother is. You may be a sibling of mine watching. (laughs) You know how that is immature and selfish and totally self-consumed to not have an, a, an acceptable gratitude for your parents. It's part of growing up and being real people. It's natural. It's something that's supposed to happen. When the writer says, well, if we know what we receive from God in the church, then we would have acceptable praise and worship for him. He's saying we would we would have a praise that is what is expected. We would be thankful. It's easy to be unthankful, ungrateful. It's easy to be uh, unhappy. It's also easy to be grateful and happy if through the eyes of faith you look at Jesus Christ and you see what he gave us in the bride, the church. is. He gave into her hands all of his words about him so we could remain in him through the church. I know that if you're like me during this time that you're not able to be here in person, you miss this place called your church. For you that are members of Holy Word Lutheran Church, the site of our building brings warm feelings and also a longing to be back together with your brothers and sisters that are here. And that's a really good thing. During this time that you're waiting and you're longing, think about what God is doing. He's making you miss your mama. Not your mama, the building or the institution called a local church by our name is Holy Word, but your mama, the Christian church, your alma mater. He's, he's making you miss her and, and, and he's also teaching you to appreciate her. And you're getting letters from her from home and you're sending your letters back. And it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. But here's what he wants. He wants you to worship and to praise him for what you're discovering by the absence to be something that's very valuable, important to you. He wants it. He wants even the absence to make a kind of worship well up inside of you to where you'll cling to what you know the church is giving you through the means of grace. And you will it will only strengthen your relationship with God and your attachment to the church, God's people on earth. He wants you to look forward to the day that we'll get back together, which hopefully will be only in a few weeks. And he wants you to have a renewed attachment and joy and and a meaningful celebration in your heart for what the, the gifts are that he gave you. And that's how a Christian can have a Mother's Day with God. Amen.